Hello everyone, my name is Martha Naro. I'm with Cyverse, the project formerly known as iPlant. Um, all we did was rename, nothing else has changed. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on um, digital imaging of root traits, um, the tool called DIRT. Um, I am now going to turn things over to Alex and let him uh, introduce himself and begin the presentation. Alex, you need to unmute. So, hello. There was a little problem because the unmute sign was not there. Um, does not work in the full screen for some reason. So, I'm Alex Books. I'm currently at the Georgia Institute of Technology in both in the School of Biology and Interactive Computing, and I developed DIRT, what we are talking about today. So this is a focus forum that should give an overview about the possibilities of DIRT, and we structured it that way that we have about 20 minutes in intro and a little bit about the DIRT development. Uh, most of the slides are put together for, an, for the audience that sent me a lot of emails before. So there will be a little bit of background, why we do DIRT, why we do phenotyping, as much as what can we do with it, what do we do with it, and then we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions and discussion before Hannah takes over. And Hannah will give a, about a 20-minute demonstration of DIRT. So how to use it, how do you can how can you use your images and after that we have another 10 minutes for discussion or in fact we have an open end open end means about 30 minutes 40 minutes for me uh, where we can also discuss about what are the future needs and how you can engage with the community of about 80 dirt users that we have at the moment so initially one can think yeah why should you think about plants, and it's very easy to, to see if you look at the pyramid of needs or human needs, and it, whatever a plant does, it's producing oxygen, it's a major food source, can be used as construction material, influences climate, and you can also derive energy from it. So it all goes in the base layer of physiological needs that you want to breathe, have food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. All the other needs, build up on that. So going further on that, you see that with ongoing climate change, it gets drier and drier and drier. And uh, everybody knows if there's no water or less water, your plants grow less nicely and they, <clears throat> they won't produce as much food or yield. And these are just moderate projections, as we know now, from the from 2000 2009 what is very close to to our situation now and you see that gradually uh, drought conditions uh, arise everywhere in the world especially in the US where this little arrow is there's a little hot, hot spot but also in the Mediterranean so if you look further into other uh, conditions that arise you see the soil degrades, which makes it even harder to grow plants. And if you change nutrient conditions, you can even see it in the field yourself that the shape of plants changes. So if you look on the at one side where you have like high nitrogen content, you see very green plants that are pretty high. And on the left side, you see low nitrogen content the field. And there you see plants that are a bit yellowish and much smaller. So you see there's a change in shape that we can actually recognize. So that's the, <clears throat> that's the first thing to recognize. So shape of plants actually changes with the environment. Why we want to look not especially on the roots is because it is predicted that by 2050 we need a approximately 
double amount of food from crops. And what happened before is whenever we improve, plant, improve plants, we simply improve by what we saw above ground. So and that's pretty much exhausted now. So going below ground and increasing the efficiency of roots, how they take up nutrients is a valid way to go. And for everybody who is not familiar with phenotyping, that's a little intro, how phenotyping works or, or why it is important or what we can observe. It is basically putting the same <coughs> a plant into different environments and compare it. So every plant has a gene and in a different environment, we will observe different structures or morphologies within the plant. So on the left side, there's the phenotype that we observe once in drought and once in well-watered conditions of the same uh, common bean genotype. And if we look at the variation, for example, in, the, in how the angle uh, goes into the soil, or if you look on, on the types of roots, so you have in the well-watered conditions, you have, uh, a, for example, a root coming out of the stem or of the, the little piece on top of the root, uh, there's a different root type involved compared to the top. Uh, so if we can link this observed variation somehow to the genome, we assume that these uh, features or traits are actually breedable. So what we do is we look mostly into the field. So what is going on in real field conditions outside, like you see it on a farm. So there is this idea that I introduced to so searching between links of the, searching for links that are between the root shape and the genes that are underlying it. And for this, we need to develop root shape descriptors that we can do, derive from any kind of mostly imaging data. Uh, the picture on the top shows a little bit the difference here on the example of a rapeseed. What we observe in the lab can vary very much from what we observe in the, in the field. So the, on the left side, you see in the lab a bit the maximum what we can achieve with the rapeseed. Um, and on the right, this is a major plant that we pulled out in the field. So natural environments, or if you're outside, you're less controlled and we have major root systems. But that's what we are working with and that's what DIRT was developed for initially. So, traits or features of the root shape. So what we are interested in is in fact, geometric traits like angles, diameters, densities uh, of the root system or within the root system. Some topologic traits like number of certain root types. And what is a, a newer or novel <coughs> way to do it is, we're also interested in, in functions or mathematical functions in that sense. Uh, that describe the whole root shape. So, but after this little intro, let's go into the uh, real data, into the images that we had historically in 2011. So when we started off, what you see here are the very first images that we got. On the, <clears throat> on one side, uh, there's the, it's a maze root, and if you look, on this white background, you see that even the scratches on the board had the same color like the root itself. You couldn't distinguish anything with this image quality, which posed the biggest problem for us at the beginning. So how do we obtain images in an ongoing field operation outside? And also on the left side, uh, it was just a cutting board that was full of, or not full of, but to a large extent, there was a lot of dirt on the on the board and we couldn't always distinguish the root from the background even so there were like these little tools lying around like on the bottom as you can see so th these are all things that disturbed our uh, image analysis at the beginning so what we did was we went out and looked what is happening there and what is happening there in the field in, in normal field operations is you go out you dig out your plant then you take this plant to a, to a washing station where the root is soaked in, in soap water to remove the soil from the, from the root system. 
and then you traditionally measured. You measured by hand, and it took you about two to three minutes to get 10 to 12, 13 traits from a root system. Traits like diameters, angles, or you sometimes you just looked at the root and you said, hey, this is a density of four, or this is a density of three, uh, simply subjective to the researcher. So we wanted to take the researcher, this part we wanted to take out. So when the researcher uh, starts measuring and measurements are related to the researcher. That's why we started automating and that's on the, on the lower, lower right side, at least on my screen. I'm not sure how you see it on <laughs> your screens, where we started a, a very first setup uh, at the Ukulima Root Biology Center in South Africa to take photos and just investigate which traits and which features of the root system can we actually extract. And where do we see variation in which uh, traits that we can extract from images. So that's, that's the very easy setup we came up with. So we take a root, we put it on a black diffusive background, and we take a photo of it. So on the left side, you see the, uh, the root crown of a maize root, uh, cut off at the same distance from the whorl where the root stock starts so that we have always the same distance on the, on the top of the root from the, as, as a trunk. We put a little scale marker in it that is simply a circle that you can reproduce everywhere. This we need to calculate the pixels into real units later. And if you want to have more detail of your root system, we just place an excise root next to it so that we can make a detailed analysis of the uh, root architecture on a sample or two samples, depending on how much, many roots you want to cut off there. So, and all of that, all our analysis goes to a, to a website. So a website that is accessible to everybody, uh, currently hosted by iPlant, and the uh, computation is run here at Georgia Tech or uh, at Tech in Austin, Texas. They provide us with the uh, computing infrastructure. So what happens here is we can currently compute about 70 traits, a little bit more than 70 traits, just from one picture. And <clears throat> all you have to do is to upload it to this website. And the following is happening. So we take the input image. This is on the left side here, on the example of a cowpea here at this, in this example. And then you See on the right side, there's like a binary mask from which we pull out the root system and then we start analyzing just this root system. So we also have knowledge about where's the marker, where's this experiment tag on the top. So we simply divide this whole picture into, into all its, its components and the objects that are in it. Um, we send that out for computation and then we get a lot of traits back, traits like the stem diameter, uh, the projected root area, or the average root density of a root system, or the diameters at the tip of the root. Um, if you write by hand, the tech extraction will fail. This I also show here because it happens a lot. I get this question a lot. <laughs> so I put all this text in there, but we cannot just tag your handwriting. Please use anything written in Word, or use a barcode, or a QR code, or something that is uh, machine readable, then we can put that into an output file uh, that is compatible with Excel. So from, these, from all these traits that we extract, I just show a few uh, correlations that, that we had between manual measurements of the traits and the automatic measurements. Uh, in particular, the top angle of a, of a maze root. So these are all maze root correlations that you see here, the top angle, the bottom angle, the stem diameter, and the width of the root system are easy to measure by hand, and we just correlated them, and we got very high correlations, generally above uh, 0.8 for the R2, R squared. And then the biggest question, is this actually somehow reproducible or significant, uh, what you do in the field? This question arises very often from uh, researchers that work in laboratory environments. 
So yes, it is. We, if we just change the label, labels of the genotypes that we observe here on the example of, a, of 2,800 maize roots uh, that we had in drought and in well watered conditions, and there were 752 genotypes. So <clears throat> what we did, we just assigned randomly the genotype labels, and we got this normal distribution that you see here. here. And if we compute a metric for the spread of this uh, data set, in the, simply by looking at what is the value of well watered and drought for the same uh, genotype, then we get this, get this normal distribution, and we see our observation, what we see there, is very much up at the very end of, the, of this normal distribution. So it's definitely not like a random assignment of, uh, of genotypes that we observe. And if you take it one step further, so what happened through this platform, not only uh, in terms of improving uh, these field experiments, we also improved simply the, the size of the experiments and what we can derive from it. So if, we, if you look at the first Shavalomics paper in 2010, we saw experiments that were either in the hundreds, but just one replicate, or we, we had a couple of tenths of genotypes with, with a few more replicates, <clears throat> and then we were ah, perhaps in, in the order of 60 to 80 samples overall. 2014, we had the first study, and we were already quite deep in the thousands of, of samples with hundreds of genotypes and uh, eight to six uh, replicates per genotype. In 2015, we had the first study where we were, again, deep in the thousands of, of individual samples. Uh, we reduced the number of genotypes so that we get more replicates uh, per genotype at the end. And what that means is nothing else that we moved from 2010, where we had, in the very first study, just scattered single points to something with a few points with a quite large standard error. And we saw 2014 smaller standard, standard errors and, and many, many uh, average uh, points per genotype. And, this, and last year, we actually saw full distributions uh, of the phenotypical traits. How does such a distribution look like? Here's just an example from a cowpea check line that we had. And we looked just at the average root density trait and things we observed there is for in this particular example that, there, that we had high and low phosphor conditions here. And while the means and also the standard deviation in fact stood very similar and was non-significantly different, we got in higher moments of the distribution in the kurtosis. And you can think of spikiness of the distribution, we found uh, significant differences. And another, and another trait that I want to discuss shortly is, and many questions came, up, came per email very often about this particular trait that showed a lot of variation. So is the D value that you find in dirt. What it is is simply, we look over the depth and we look how, at which portion of the depth is how, which portion of the width of the root accumulated. This trait is simply computed from, from this binary image that I showed before that you just extracted out of the, uh, out of the original image. We take from the outlines of both sides of the root system and we average it. That's the red line you see. And this red line, you smooth out a little bit to compensate for, for the spiky uh, roots or little roots that peak out of the, of the root system. So if you look at this outline in a bit more smooth way, we can derive a accumulated function of that. That's the blue line that you see in the, in the, in the plot on the right side. And for example, you see at D10, which means 10% of the width is accumulated somewhere around 0 or 35% of the depth. 
So in this curve, we saw also already varying a lot. So this does not have to be straight. It can have a belly to the top or to the, to the bottom, to the bottom a, a little belly. And that's where we saw a lot of uh, variation in it un until now. And I hope it's now clearer what this trade is because I got a lot of emails over the time just for this particular trade. So this was a little introduction. And before I hand over to Hannah, and she will give the demo with where, where you can see also all the trades that are in here. Uh, thank you for participating. It was quite overwhelming uh, participation from the beginning. And we were quite surprised that we not, had not only people from North America joining in, but also from Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. And that's the, the statistics from this morning at 9 o'clock. I saw there were many more people joining at the time. A little bit where the money was coming from. So we got access to the farms via Jonathan Lynch uh, that were financed by the Buffett Foundation. There was a NSF project involved. Uh, IPlan gave a little bit of money to it and also the Center for Data Analytics at Georgia Tech. And I'm now happy to take all the questions you typed into the chat now. Thank you. So, I just scroll back here now. I see. The first question is, how can I remove the screen of your face? So, hmm? I don't know. I think this is a technical question that goes to, to Marta. And. Okay, well, here's the first question about dirt. So what is the expected resolution of images? Um, it's up to you. So typically we use something like 2,000 to 3,000 pixels with higher end cameras. And meanwhile, you can do that with an iPhone. That's important. For the measurement setup, you want to have a measurement setup where you look from the top perpendicular down to the root. This can be done with a tripod, but any other mounting system is also OK for, for dirt. It's not that sensible to this. The correct for the tilt, or for a little bit for the tilt of the camera by analyzing the round scale marker to get the orientation uh, of the camera. So how is the circle projected to 2D, and then we project it back. So if we see a little ellipse, so we just correct for it and project it back to a circle, and that corrects also for your measurements. And yes, so there's the next question. Is it necessary to have a scale? If you want to have cent centimeters, yes, definitely. You need this scale marker in it. Otherwise, you can always enter in dirt. 0.0, .0 centimeters or 0.0, .0 for the scale marker and will give you back the pixels. So you still have a measurement where the unit is pixels. Um, it's up to you if you how, how you recalculate then the measurements into into the unit you like. Notably for angles, that, that's not necessary. So they are not dependent on the scale marker. Um, Black background. Black background is preferable for us. Uh, you can use, in fact, any other background too. Uh, for when we started making this setup, we found that a diffuse black background is the easiest to reproduce wherever we are. Uh, I did a lot of, or I have a lot of images with a blue background and also from systems that uh, it's, it's like little spikes coming out. It's like a plexiglass system uh, where we also extract the root in. It works. You can use other backgrounds. 
Uh, however, I think if you start a new study and you want to use dirt, I would go with the black background because we have most experience with it. Um, the K feed is, let's say, the, the algorithm that we use to extract the root from the background is pretty general. It covers a lot, a, a huge range of, uh, of different backgrounds, of variation in the background. So it, it can increase your computation time if you don't test before which background is best for you. And who else figured it out? Nice talk. Does the scale need to be a circle? Yes, definitely. It has to be a circle. Otherwise, we cannot uh, correct for, um, for the rotation or, or the tilt of your camera. So yes, definitely. Nothing else than a circle. Can be even a coin. If you just have a quarter, just put this in. So I have a couple of students here that just put a quarter on the board. Next questions. Um, does it count the root hairs, or is it just density measurement for root hairs? Root hairs, um, no. This is for the root architecture of the system. It does not count root hairs. You need a microscope for that. We don't see them. If you look just here on the thank you slide, do you, I don't see any root hairs on there. They are really, really microscopic, small. But if you have an excise root placed next to it, we can go into the finer laterals and get some estimates from that. Another question is from Adam. Uh, does it matter which type of root you use the excise root, e.g. maize crown roots versus lateral roots it doesn't matter they should have a certain size so initially we implemented it uh, for for crown roots and brace roots but you can use other roots uh, don't make them too small so if you make if you have very fine excise roots you might want to take separate pictures and just calculate uh, in your the excise root separately from the root crown you, just make two images then if they get very small. And now I have to find the next questions. Oh, who is, are you able to estimate the angles of the various roots using dirt? Yes, there are many, many angles in there. So angles of the complete root, root system on the top, which is about at the D10 value where 10% of the width is accumulated. We also measure it where 80% 80% of the width is accumulated. We measure that uh, for legumes, we can go a little bit into the architecture because the legumes are simply sparser and you get uh, average measurements of all the roots that are coming out of the hypocotyl and all the basal roots. We also segment them into adventitious and basal roots. So you get quite a lot of angles there at certain distances or certain percentage uh, from the, from the hypocotyl. Also, if you have an excise root, we estimate the angle of the laterals. So if you have a crown root or a brace root excised from the root system, yeah, we look at the angles of the individual laterals. So let's switch over to the question and answer thing. So there is somebody asking, I do not see the separate chat window. Um, okay, it should be here now. Then, did you explore dirt use in storage roots like potato, sweet potato? We are exploring it now. <laughs> in fact, before this call, I had a call about that. Um, there are ideas to extend dirt. At the moment, we, we just support fibrous root systems because we see. We simply can reduce them to a line. Um, but there are ideas about looking into storage roots like potato, sweet potato, also carrots. We, we discussed, in fact, doing tests, the first tests um, in two weeks. So if you 
it's an anonymous anonymous viewer here that asks that. Just drop me an email and sure, I'll let you know how far it is. Um, next question. Is there any recommendation on any microscope as where the original image is taken from to have better results? How many images can dirt work on at a time? So, first question. We take normal cameras. We don't take uh, microscopy pictures at the moment. If you have a good background, you might try that and run it and you see what comes out. Perhaps the traits just work for you. This happens quite a lot. So we have already a few users that use very different systems that, than we intended and they still get good traits out and good measurements. So I would say just try it. And how many images can work can dirt work on at one time? So I hope I'm not lying, but I think Stampede has a hundred thousand nodes, not more. That's the limit. <laughs> and pay, the pace system at Georgia Tech has also about sixty thousand nodes. So to be realistic, I think you you can allocate about three to five thousand if you really need to. But mostly we are smaller. We are in the range of 600, 300 to 600 that we allocate. If the data set is so big. So most data sets, so except for the data sets that I often get from Hannah, uh, the data sets are actually smaller. Most, the typical data sets of students in the field are in the order of hundreds at the moment. So we have now several data sets that go up to four, about 4,000. 5,000 images. Um, yeah, they are fun to work with, and I hope more people make these big data sets to, to analyze root systems. Let's see. What I, thank you. I see here. Um, are there any studies about whether excising the root crown alters the angles between crown and lateral roots and the primary root stalk? Excising the root does not alter your angle. Not at all. Why should it? You just take out one, one root, or you make two pictures. You take the whole root crown, make a picture, make a second picture with all the excised ones. That's a possibility you can do. So there's an option in Dirt where you just say, OK, I only want the excised root traits. Then, only ex then we only search for excised roots and assume, hey, you only have excess roots in your picture, and you put them next to each other, and you tell us how many you have per picture, uh, just as an orientation. Then you have two pictures, so one of the root crown with the original angle and all the excess roots analyzed. That's possible. Just uh, you have to enter it by forehand in, in the, into the form when you set up your computation. Um, ah, sorry. I mean, dust digging up. Now the question changed. <laughs> uh, sorry, I mean, does digging up the root change the angle between the crown roots and the main root stalk? As far as I know, no. So we, the, all the maize roots are pretty stiff. There's not much changing. Uh, for beans or other legumes, yes. Uh, but this simply the. The root system is a bit of on the flappy side, call it like that. So it's not a very stiff root system. So we have to measure very close to the hypopopular, in fact. OK, thanks. I see. Yeah. Any more questions? No? So that was really a quick introduction into it. And I hand now over to Hannah. So Hannah, a little story about her is, Hannah started with me and Dirt very, very early on. In fact, she went through all the initial algorithm development. And she, yeah, 
she just did a great job. She was very patient with all the bugs at the beginning and <laughs> with everything that happened while, while we developed the first uh, traits to be extracted. And she also helped sometimes with defining such traits. And some would say she's the, the first real user of DIRT. And in that sense, uh, I want to hand over to Hannah that just ex starts explaining you on an example how DIRT works for her in, I think now, eight or 10 studies that you did in your PhD or even more. Yeah, so thanks, Alex. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. So um, I hope everyone can see my, my DIRT screen here. I'm going to be giving a demo on just um, taking you through how to upload an image into DIRT. I'm creating a, a image collection, a marked collection, and all the way to a computation. So um, to get started, we're going to go to dirt.iaplantcollaborative.org. And we see the main um, welcome page here. This page explains some information about DIRT. Um, it has the links to some of the DIRT publications in plant physiology and plant methods. And it also has a link to the Google group, which is a really cool resource um, to use for questions um, and uh, about DIRT. So I highly recommend that everyone join the Google group. And then if you are stuck on DIRT, you can look and see if someone else has already asked your question or you can ask the question and then users can um, respond with their advice or um, their thoughts for solving. So first, I'm going to log in up on the upper right hand corner into DIRT with my iPlant account. I'm logging in. going to take one second. So this is um, my profile page. You can see the information about me, my profile picture. We encourage all DIRT users to fill out your name and the about me. Um, you can do that by going to the edit tab and filling out your information here, uploading a picture, and then just press saving at the bottom. So I'm going to go up here on the top bar about DIRT. So we have um, the PIs involved in DIRT, including Alex, who just gave the presentation, some of his contact information, the lead developer, and then some of the partners and users of DIRT. If you are interested in administering DIRT, you can look at these tabs, the pipeline, the downloads, and the videos. But I think most of you are users, so um, that won't apply to you. So I think the most important um, tab for first time users for DIRT is this getting started tab here. So under the quick start, we have a DIRT quick start PDF, which just basically is a huge PDF that has um, screenshots, step-by-step -step and step-by-step -step instructions about how to upload your images on DIRT and compute the traits. So after the webinar, if you have a question or forget something, this is a great resource to, to take a look at and um, it can probably answer your question. Then we have an FAQ tab um, about what is DIRT, what is the marked collection, some of the frequently asked questions. Um, we have a tutorial, again, step-by-step -step tutorial. And then there's also some videos about how to register and log in, making a root collection, computing. So in this getting started tab is a great resource for um, if you get stuck or if you have some questions about DIRT. So now for the fun part, I'm going to um, start by making a root collection. So I'm going to go to roots and create a root collection. So um, I have a nice image of a, I hope you can see it. I have a nice image of a root um, ready to go. And first I'm going to type in a title. I'm going to call it webinar January 1. I'm going to um, give my root collection a description. So I'm going to say maze root 
genotype, genotype A grown in Pennsylvania in 2015. The day of plantation, I'm going to say it's May 29th, 2015, and the harvest we'll say was August 29th, 2015. And then you can fill out things like soil moisture, soil nitrogen level, soil phosphorus level, and potassium level, um, what soil group it was in, any pesticides applied or disease levels, and then you can um, link in a location to where the roots were harvested. So I'm gonna say State College, and I'm gonna press Save. So this is the first step, which is creating a root collection. The next step is going to be adding images to this image collection. So I'm gonna go here to Add Files. And I'm going to select a nice root image and press upload. So you can, um, at this point, you can upload to, to up to 200 images in a root collection. So I just uploaded one, but you can select up to 200 images. So I wanted to go in this root collection. Um, the genus is Z. You can enter the species, family, um, dry biomass, fresh biomass, SPAD the age of the plant, and the resolution, if you have that information. And I'm going to click Add to Collection. So now if I go to Roots, and this is the public tab, but if I go to My tab, we have this nice root collection. You have my image there, the description, the location, and all the metadata associated with this data set. And at this point, you can do a number of things. You can click here, you can download, we download the images, you can download the metadata, you can delete images out of this collection, and you can also add images to this collection. Um, for example, if you're collaborating with someone, um, you can create a root collection and then add them to the group. So on this top tab, this group, you can add people. For example, I can add Alex to this root collection. So now he can see it and I can see, we can both see this root collection. So the next step is to create a marked collection. So marked collections are useful when you have um, image, root image collections from different years that you want to combine and compute into one large computation. So um, I'm going to select my image and I'm going to say add to marked collection. And I'm going to say I do not have a marked collection. If I already had a marked collection, I would say yes. And then you can select your marked collection. But I'm going to create a new marked collection and I'm going to call it webinar January. January. I'm going to press next. So we have now a marked collection, which I'll show you on the marked collection tab. We have a, a marked collection called Webinar January, and it has one root image. So I can click it here, and it's one root image. So for example, if I had two images I wanted to combine, I can go to a different root collection called Webinar, Webinar January, and I can add also this image to my marked collection. So I'm going to add it to a marked collection. I'm going to say yes, I have a marked collection and add it. So now in my marked collection, I have two root images. The next step is um, to calibrate. So on the top, I'm going to go to the calibration tab and calibrate. I'm going to say uh, marked collection webinar January and press go. And then I'm going to click a representative root and say calibrate threshold. Now this is going to take, it takes a few minutes. Um, you just have to wait till the calibration completes. It completes a binary mask um, with different thresholding levels um, for you to select which thresholding level is the optimal level for your image set. 
So if I already have prepared a calibration, which you'll see when the calibration step stops. So here's um, a root with a um, calibration mask of one, three, five, 10, 15, and 20. And in this step, you're really looking for a, a mask that really covers the whole root. There's no large gaps in the stem area. So I think for this image, maybe 10 is a good calibration threshold. So here at the bottom, we see a 10. So the next stage is to go to the computation, the last tab on the navigation bar. We're gonna to go to computation and create a computation. So I'm gonna make the title webinar January. You can make the title anything you want. And um, the marked root collection I'm gonna use is called webinar January. The masking threshold is 10. We decided 10 was the best. Um, you can modify this to whatever masking threshold was best in your calibration. In my scale marker, I put at 25.4. And your scale marker is that little circle you have in your image. And um, 25.4 is the diameter in millimeters of my scale marker. So if you would need to modify this scale marker value to whatever value your scale marker has in your images. And your scale marker in the whole, all the images you want to com um, compute, the scale marker must have the same size. So if you have scale markers of different size, they need to go in different computations. And my scale marker, this is in millimeters. So I know when my computation results come out, my values, that have a length unit, those will be in millimeters. If you put the scale marker and value in centimeters, the value that comes out in dirt will be centimeters for those phenotypes that apply. So that's important to note. So I'm gonna say my image requires segmentation. It has a root crown, the big crown of roots we saw. And in my image, we have no excised roots. So you can, you can, Choose maybe your root image has the crown in one excised root um, sitting by it, like Alex showed before. And that's also a possibility. So you can choose one in that case. But in this case, I have zero. You can also run an image with only excised roots and no root crown. In that case, you would uncheck the root crown and put one excised root. That can be modified. So dirt can compute uh, a number of traits. The common traits are all of the traits dirt can compute. We have um, traits specifically aimed for dicot roots like beans. We have traits specifically um, geared towards monocot traits like maize. And then we have traits that are specifically geared towards the excised roots, for example, lateral branching thing, length, length and density. So um, you can, of course, by default, all of the traits are gonna be computed. Um, to save some computing time and to make my computation go faster, I typically like to uncheck the traits that are not useful for my study. So I'm not interested in dicot traits and I'm not interested in excise root traits. So I'm gonna uncheck those because I just have a, a maze crown. So I'm gonna save the computation. And you can see it has submitted to the grid and um, you receive an email in your email account saying your job has been successfully submitted. And then usually it takes a few hours depending on how many images you, su you submit and you get another email saying your job has been completed and then you can log on back on the computation in my tab. And if I refresh, you can see that the job has been submitted here. This is the one I just created. So um, for the sake of time, so we don't have to wait for that, I created one earlier today called, create a bunch of them, but this is what you would see when your computation finishes. So um, in this collection, I only had one image and it says all the the computation 
um, parameters that we typed in. So masking threshold of 10, the scale marker, it has root crown, it was completed, and then we have the image metadata and the computed traits. So for this page, if you want, if you are again collaborating with people and you want to be able to them to access this information on their account, you can go to group and you can add people. And for example, I can add Alex again. So the members are Alex and Hannah, and he has access to this page and he can look up um, the computation settings and all the images and the masking thresholds. So this image metadata, this is where you're going to find the SPAD rating, the plant biomass that you typed in earlier. So if you want to go back and check what the, the values you put in, you can download that CSV file. The output CSV file is um, the traits that have been computed. So this is just a CSV file with all the trait names as the headers and um, all the trait values. I'm going to see if I can try to open it up. I'm not positive this is going to work. Yeah. I don't think I can. Um, I'm not sure I can. Uh, oh, wait a second. Here we go. There we go. So, for example, this is um, the CSV file of um, that you would get as a dirt output. So we have the image ID, we have the image name, um, and all your dirt traits. So. The simple stem diameter, the stem diameter is 12 millimeters in this case, the bottom angle, the top angle, and the list goes on and 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 on. So that's what the dirt output looks like. If you have questions about what um, specific traits mean, for example, the difference between stem diameter and simple stem diameter, that's explained in the manuscript. And I think it's also explained on the uh, website. So I'm going to go back to this page and I'm going to answer questions. Okay. So the first question is, um, what does the segment segmentation step do? And Alex already answered this. So the segmentation steps extracts the root out of this image. And this is um, the mask you saw before in the presentation. So the segment step is extracting the root out of the um, presentation. Um, does DIRT work well on, if Alex, if you want to unmute yourself, you can also help me answer this question. So does DIRT work well on young seedling systems as well as mature crowns? So um, yes, DIRT, dirt works well on, I think, all types of, of root systems, um, as long as it has roots thick enough that you can take a picture and you can see visually and that the binary mask can detect. Um, it works well on, on all ages of roots. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you look at seedlings, they are very similar to an excised uh, root from a maize crown. As if not similar from a biology point of view, <laughs> but if for, for the analysis, they are very similar and you probably get good traits with it. So nobody has done it so far definitely think of that and we get a lot of images from people that didn't follow our protocol and somehow we can make it work if you have pictures just try it but the ones that I saw so far yeah I would or that I know from other people they would work if you have a good background so um, there's a question on how do we set up the calibration threshold so basically, um, what I explained before, you go to the, the 
calibration tab here and you press calibrate and then you then you go through the steps you press go and it, it calibrates and then you visually look what calibration is best so you want a, a threshold that is covering your whole root that's not missing any parts that looks like it's a good mask for your root and it says the value and then you put that value in to the computation settings so I chose the value 10 for my calibration which is the best threshold and then I take that value 10 and when I'm setting up my computation I put that number in can you show so, the open calibration page I think you didn't do that in the presentation open a calibration page yeah select the cal calibration let's say select the first one yeah oh I did I did maybe just um, yeah, you just showed the pictures, but there's a whole page where you can actually select the right threshold and then it's transferred to your computation entries. Yes, yeah, so I didn't do that because um, it takes a long time. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so I encourage everyone to go on to the, the dirt and, and try the calibration. It takes a few minutes to be able to process that. That's why I didn't do it in this webinar. But if you, it's really simple. You just go through the steps, step by step, through the calibration page, and uh, you'll see it. Um, Quan asked the question: If I have a root image without the scale in the image, but I know the scale as the number of pixels per millimeter, is there a place when I can put the scale somehow and can dirt analyze the image without a scale? Yes, dirt can do that without a scale. Just enter 0.0, .0 as the scale marker diameter. Um, but you have to recalculate all the traits yourself. So we don't, <laughs> don't send me an Excel file. Uh, yeah, so if you put zero as the value in the scale marker, your, your output CSV file will be in pixels. And then you can manually convert your pixels to centimeters in Excel or whatever you want, but if you put zero on the scale marker, it's pixel. Um, is it has a stat program incorporated or is it just the output files? So right now it's just the output files that you get in the, the, the CSV format. But maybe Alex will incorporate a statistics section later. We can do that. At a certain point, <laughs> no, there's, no, there's nothing against incorporating statistics. Uh, in fact, we had statistics at, in during the development. We had at a certain point even the st little statistics in it, not all of them. But yeah, sure, we could share that too via the platform and just integrate all the statistics we do anyhow on on root systems. Um, there's another question saying whether the output includes the color traits of roots. So the answer is no. Be because we have a binary threshold, it, we convert the color image into a black and white image, and that's the image that is computed. So there's no color traits. I actually, for a lot of my maize roots, um, some of the roots are a really dark purple, or a really dark color, not the roots, but the stem is a really dark color and it blends in with a black background. So sometimes I take a can of green spray paint and I am spray painting the roots uh, to increase the contrast between the roots and the black background. Um, so no, dirt does not do color. There's also another reason. So we tried at the beginning to, to look into uh, color in the, or color analysis in the field. It turned out it is simply from an operational point of view. If you want to harvest about a thousand roots or two thousand, it it takes a lot of time to get color calibrated in the field, especially if you don't have a house next by or anything. So, just it takes you a day, and your lightning conditions is constantly changing. So you you hardly get that really calibrated out there, unless you want to recalibrate your camera every five minutes and then. Most people would just give up. It takes too much time. Okay, so the next question is, in case you image um, live roots, growing roots every day, 
um, would it be possible to measure the growth increase between images easily? I'm giving that one to you, Alex. Oh, I incorporated all. Uh, I don't see this question. So, um, can you repeat the question? I was. A little yeah. Off. In case you image live roots, like roots that are growing every day, um, would it be easy to measure the growth changes between the images? Uh, sure. You just get per image, you get a file with all the traits and the change between the same trait is your, is your growth change described. So, if you for example, you can measure in dirt the length of a very sparse root system. And yeah, you see the length change. If you have all the images, if you have a time series, you can upload that. Um, you have to calculate it yourself, though we don't do the, we don't calculate the change. It's just easy for you because you get at every time point, you get a measurement and let's say, at day one, your root is perhaps 30 centimeter long, and at day two, it's 32, and then 38, and whatever. So you have to uh, analyze the changes yourself. But we can detect from different images different changes. So the next question is, what do you think about die-cut traits for corn images? <laughs> um, is corn a die-cut? Should I ask that? So I think I think um, yeah. If you look at the at the description of all the traits, I think a lot of the dicot traits don't apply to monocot traits. So it's basically like you know talks about traits of um, basal roots, for example, in dicots and maize and monocots don't have any basal roots. So um, maybe some of the traits would be helpful, but. It depends on what species you're looking at, but I would really look at those those descriptions of what every phenotype is, and you can decide what phenotypes you want to use. Maybe for your study, a dicot uh, trait is helpful, but from my experience, I just focus on the monocot traits. So the dicot traits might be useful if you're looking at very young uh, monocots. When they're, as long as the root system stays sparse, you might find something in the monocot uh, in the dicot traits but definitely i think they are not useful for uh for major maize root systems or rice root systems definitely not um so do stained roots have any advantage over the unstained roots studied by dirt i'm not sure if i'm clear what what stained means I don't know if you're talking about me coloring the roots with the, the spray paint, but as far as... Um, I think she means microscopy pictures. Oh, microscopy pictures. Um, sure, coloring everything... The roots, coloring the roots with, with like painting the whole root crown? I, I'm gonna assume that's what you mean. Right on chat, if that's not what you mean. But, um, <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, it really doesn't make any, there's no advantage really, and it doesn't make any difference in the computation. It's only to increase the contrast between your root system and your background. And it'll be really clear if your root system and your background don't have enough contrast in that, that calibration step. So in your calibration step, if you can fully um, pick out your, your root in white, that means that um, you have a good contrast, but maybe you need to, to spray paint it if your root or your stem is a really dark purple or, or close to black. So how important is it to add the soil moisture in pH levels? Is it mandatory? No, it's not mandatory, but it helps a lot. Like if you publish your paper and you open up your data, somebody else might want to reuse your data or combine it with other free data out there. So you will help the, the overall research community a lot if you document that. Because data sets without documentation are useless. So you, you, you don't want just to link your paper, you, you just want to give the data in one place. So not mandatory, but if you like, you can help. 
or we hope you helped. Um, someone scanned roots on an Epson scanner with the resolution that's uh, really high and gives 800 megabyte images. Do you think these would work, or we need to have um, pictures with a smaller resolution? Uh, for the public version that is running on iPlan, please reduce these images. And these so, images can be reduced um, in a batch file. So if you, I ran into the same problem, but I had a lot of images that were really high resolution and really, really large. So I just downloaded Irfan Viewer, and you can batch um, re resize them to a smaller resolution. That's what my recommendation would be. So what, what works quite well is if you uh, use the compression in a TIFF file. That I think the Epson scanners, they always have these. Is this, a, is this a raw file or what is the format of this file? I'll wait till Brad responds. JPEG. JPEG, 800 megabytes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Uncompressed probably. So turn on the compression. That helps a lot. Because you, you cannot transfer unlimited data. So that's a, perhaps a limitation uh, of, the, of this free installation of DIRT. So you can only transfer about a gigabyte per day. So 800 megabytes is already quite close to that. So it would take you a lot of days to transfer all the images. Uh, turn on the compression in the JPEG or convert it to a compressed TIFF. Or reduce the resolution. I think for most applications, 2,000 to 3,000 or even lower is fine as a, res as a resolution of the image. I don't know how these images look like, so, so how much structure is in the image itself. It's hard to imagine from the description. So can DIRT compute infrared images? Can, yeah, sure it can. Um, if there's in your infrared image enough uh, contrast between the background and the foreground, so. But note, infrared, if you're going to infrared, there's, uh, so you're, you're not looking at visible surface properties. So everything that gets, gets reflected in infrared uh, is dependent on, on the surface properties. Um, yeah, it will be hard, harder to get a background. Probably a, oh, a cloth, would be, if you have cloth in the background, like fibrous cloth, it would absorb most of the infrared. So we did that with the near infrared laser scanners uh, to extract the background. So it's a guess. I cannot uh, send me such an image and I basically can tell you if, if these images would work, but there's nothing against uh, infrared images itself. So the next question is, can you combine computation for experiments that use different image scales? Um, so my recommendation, if you have images with different image scales, you can do two things. You can either set your um, scale marker to zero and then put them in one computation and your file comes out of pixels, and then if you know which images are which, you can convert them separately at the end. Um, but what I would recommend is running it in two separate computations and making the scale marker both, all both in the same unit. So maybe one is 20 millimeters and one's 30 millimeters. And then you have two um, CSV files that come out, but the units are in millimeters, and then they can be combined at that point. So I recommend if you have uh, Scale markers with two different sizes. You, you, you do two separate computations with the same units in the scale marker, and then you can combine um, the data at the end. This is a question for you, Alex. Which I have one? photos of small rice savings with a shoot and few leaves attached. Can dirt separate shoot and root? No, we don't do that. We hope you use something like Irfan View to cut off the shoot and then send it up to us. Um, theoretically, it would be possible, but uh, we never did something with root and shoot. I would just cut off the shoot from the picture, just go to an 
image processing program, select the root, and cut cut out the shoot. Yeah, that's what I would do with it. One more question, or? Yeah, there's a few more, I think. Is the data automatically public, or can data be private to the research group? Um, it's automatically private. But uh, yeah, we hope that you make your data public after your publication. So you can change that. That's not a big deal. Um, you can even uh, choose the Creative Commons license that you want to attach to it. So if you just want it free for research, give it just free for research and block it from any uh, commercial use. So that's up to you. It's about what license you use and yeah, you can keep it private during your research. There's nothing against it. By the way, the, I, so if, if you want to have help on a data set that you, uh, that you try to process and it doesn't work and there's a problem or whatever, or you need any help, you always have to share the data with me or with Hannah or with anybody else that should help you. So even I cannot look into your data set. So I have no way uh, to look into your data uh, on iPlan. Just that's how private it is. But this also means whenever you need help, please share the data with me. It's one of the most common emails that I send back. Please share the data with me and the computation. And everybody's surprised I cannot just click around and get other one's data. No, it's not possible. So we secure that. I can see how much gigabytes you use, yes, and also the number of data sets that you have, but I cannot see your data. Okay. I... I think that is all the questions. Um, thanks to everybody for sending in questions. Um, it's really been a great question and answer and a wonderful webinar. So I'd like to thank both Alex and Hannah. And to the participants, um, the slides will be made available. The webinar recording will be made available. So watch for an email from me later today um, with some links in it. And we also appreciate any feedback that you give us. There will be a, a link to a very short um, feedback survey. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, Alex.